there's a whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. That UFO podcast is powered by Zencaster. Zencaster is one of the world's leading platforms for recording and hosting podcasts. Zencaster is a modern web-based solution for high-quality audio and video podcast production. With a full suite of professional tools, Zencaster allows podcasters to quickly and seamlessly record their guests remotely and produce their podcasts in studio quality. Check out the links in the show description to find out more. UFO at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0 and I am blown away by the performance. The craftsmanship and details on the 4.0 are next level. with the code andyufo at manscaped.com remember that's 20% off and free shipping on any products they've got on the website thanks folks i am george knapp listening to that ufo podcast and having one hell of a good time hi everyone and welcome back to that ufo podcast my name is andy and it's good to get back to the interviews it seems like with august uh, we had the uh, avi loeb and james fox interview and one or two other bits and then the rest of it's been news and discussion so lots of interviews lined up over the next couple of weeks and i've dropped a lot of those names already with more still to be confirmed but i'm really excited to get into this one because it's a, a book i've read and enjoyed i'd like to welcome author and researcher based out in the lovely island of malta i've visited as a child, Warren Adjus. Warren, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's an honor being here. No, it's really good to speak to you. And this book, uh, do you know what? I, I'm going to quote this early on. I was going to bring it up later, but yeah. I listened to an interview you done uh, a few months ago and you mentioned that you were, I'm probably going to steal your thunder here because you might have said this <laughs> on the interview, but I, I really like the fact that you had went looking for a book like this and yeah. you couldn't find one, and that's what drove you to, to write the book, and you can really tell that. And we're going to get to, to talking, Warren, about the book. Um, of course, the book is Evidence of Extraterrestrials. Over 40 cases prove aliens have visited Earth. 
and that's that's a bold statement to make just in the title of a book so exactly. we, we will get to that now you've had quite an interesting time as a researcher and obviously now author i'd like to find out firstly a little background warren from yourself what's led you in life into ufology to the point of now researching and writing a book um prior to writing this book um, I've always been interested in, in space and in astronomy. Um, and naturally, I, I was familiar with certain, you know, conspiracy theories like the moon landing. Um, but then I, I read a book by Jim Mars. It's called Daily Agenda. And that's, that's when I got into UFOs and what it all means. And then I started questioning uh, what, what these vehicles were, who, you know, who piloted them, where did they come from? And I had a, a bunch of questions, which, which essentially, you know, to this day, we don't know the answers to them. Um, but then I started reading, reading many books. Um, uh, you know, uh, Jim Mars, um, of course, uh, he's one of the most renowned authors and my favorite author. Um, but as I, as I kept reading um, material, I realized that there was um, a lack of um, unified book, which essentially covered all of uh, the most significant cases. Um, and that's what I wanted with this book. I wanted to find, I wanted to create a book that could be used as a reference book um, so that people would, uh, could find perhaps the most convincing cases in, in just one book, essentially. Excellent. And, and when you were growing up, did you ever have any interest in UFOs, extraterrestrials yourself? Did you ever have any sightings? I, I want to say yes, but I never did, unfortunately. Um, uh, after I started reading, I started looking up at the sky more, you know, hoping I could see something, but it always turned out to be either a meteorite or a satellite. Um, I never saw any, any weird lights in the sky. Um, I'm still hoping I will, I will experience something like that. Um, but this is, I always say this, you know, you never see, you don't, you don't see viruses, but just because you don't see them doesn't mean they don't exist. And it's the same, the same, I guess with UFOs, it's just because you don't, not everybody sees them. It doesn't mean that they don't exist either. That's very, very true. What about any family interests growing up? Did you ever have any relatives who were interested in the subject or did you just sort of organically get involved in space, astronomy and, and UFOs? Um, I've been interested in space since I was a kid, but nobody uh, here in Malta, the topic of UFOs, it's not really something we talk about. It's um, it's just something that people are bothered with. Um, and I'm, and it's by pure coincidence that I even read Jim Mars' book. Um, in actual fact, I was reading a book here. He, he had written about 9-11. And then um, I started looking at other books he wrote. And that's when I read Alien Agenda. So it was genuinely by pure coincidence that I read that first book, which then essentially put me down a rabbit hole of researching and writing. Why do you think there there is a lack of interest in Malta in this subject? Obviously, I, I've talked about on the podcast before, I feel ad nauseum about the, the lack of interest in the UK. Yeah. And it's it's disappointing, especially when you have a big interest in the subject. And I love that a lot of listeners get in touch with me telling me it's nice to have people to talk to the subject about. Have you found it's a sort of lonely subject to be involved in within Malta? And lonely and also ridiculing. I mean, so many times I have conversations and people... Um, sort of, uh, they they talk in such a um, uh, in in a silly way, you know. They don't take the phenomenon seriously, and then uh, as I start speaking, you know, about that it's not about just weird lights; it's about you know advanced technology. That's when they start sort of realizing that it's a serious conversation to have. Um, people here, it's it's they not only don't talk about it, but when they when it is brought up in the media. Um, everyone just ridicules it and uh, um, no, no one takes it seriously, which is very infuriating, I guess. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's better than having conversations with people who would just um, ridicule you. Um, so I'd rather just not have a conversation rather than wasting my time trying to convince people if that makes sense. 
Absolutely. And I think a lot of listeners listening could relate to that as well. I know I certainly can, where you feel you, you're the only person with a, an interest in this subject and is reaching out and getting to know others and having that conversation. And it's always nice when you do manage to speak to someone, though, who doesn't have an interest or who's yeah. very, very skeptical. And you can just say to them, you know, forget about aliens and flying saucers and, exactly. and little green men. Forget about things yeah. coming from Mars. Let, yeah. Let's just talk about what might be being seen because these things are being seen and um, as great people like yourself from you know other countries that are outside of you know the big nations that people might talk about are trying to promote that culture and conversation as well um you also uh, as part of your bio m- mentioned you interviewed Whitley Schreiber and Stanton Friedman yeah. now obviously two famous names within the subject of course Stanton yeah. Friedman no longer with us um how did those interviews also come about um so so the one thing I wanted to do with my book is present just factual evidence. Um, all of the information I have, it comes from a declassified projects or witness statements. Um, but then I'm also familiar, uh, uh, naturally, I'm, I'm familiar with these authors and I know that these are experts in the field. Um, and that's when I wanted to include Stanton in, in, in my book. You know, he's a nuclear physicist. He knows how, how, how he's been studying the phenomenon for years. So I reached out to him and and we talked about UFOs and I asked him several questions, um, most notably about, uh, you know, the intentions, um, uh, so on and so forth. And apart from that, he was one of the first researchers in the Roswell case. So I had to um, get his opinion on that. Um, So I included Stanton's interview in the first book. Uh, Whitley Strieber, given that he's an abductee, I'm holding on to the interview I have with him to include in my second book, which is about abductions, but I'm still working on that. But he's a very genuine man. And and his story may seem far-fetched, of course. And there are some bold claims in it, but you can sense his genuinity and 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 it's so traumatic. It was so traumatic to him, both both physiologically and psychologically, that um, to this day, he still says that he's traumatic. I mean, one 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 question I asked him is that if he noticed the difference between who he was in the past and who he is now. And his reply was that prior to his encounter, he was innocent. And now it was as though he was um, traumatized. Absolutely. It's a, it's a well-known case and, and one we'll get to discussing down the line, no doubt, on the podcast as well. Um, but you, you've mentioned the book and that was interesting. You've already mentioned the second book and we'll, I'll ask you some stuff about that later. The book, again, Evidence of Extraterrestrials, over 40, ca- over 40 cases prove aliens have visited Earth. How long ago did you start writing the book? When was your initial ideas for it? When did those come up? Um, so my initial ideas happened uh, were three years ago, that's when I started compiling compiling um, in the documents. But the most challenging part of the book is actually um, getting those documents. Um, it's easy to Google uh, an encounter and then getting the information and copying and pasting it or rephrasing it. But I didn't want to do that. Um, um, I, three years ago, I started researching through uh, the freedom of uh, the freedom of information act um where they essentially declassified documents and that's when i started getting these documents um and i started reading into cases which are lesser known um such as the frederick valentic um case um and i wanted to include the lesser known cases as well because everyone knows about roswell you know everyone knows about the battle of la Mm. or the foo fighters and of course i included them in the book because you cannot not include them of course um but i think that there are the lesser known cases are more convincing than the ones that we talk about a lot um but it took around a year even more than a year to actually get all the information i wanted and then a further year to to write the book so the process was around two and a half years. Um, it was very difficult. It was, it was such a long process that um, there were many times where I, I asked myself, what's the point of even doing all of it? Um, but then when you look at it from as a whole, as, as a holistic project, um, I, I wanted, I actually use this book myself as a reference for when I want, you know, to 
to read a- about a particular case, which I have forgotten details about. Um, and I also um, have, have had many people reach out to me and tell me that they like that, you know, if they want to read about um, a, um, a crash, they can go to the second section if they want to it's comp- it's divided in a way that it's organized and you can find what you really want to read about. It's not that kind of book that you have to read from the first page till the last page. It's more about um, according what you want to read about. Yeah, and like you say, it's very well split up. There's the four main parts. So you've got modern sightings, part one. Part two is crashes and landings. Part three is military pursuits. And then part four is government projects. And, you know, at a a glance, you you look through, for example, part three, you've got military pursuits. And you look in there, it mentions the gimbal, the go fast, the tic tac. And then I know about those. I like to think I know quite a lot about them and many people listening would probably think so as well. Exactly, yeah. But then you look and go, like you mentioned, there was the the disappearance of Frederick Valentik and I was like, okay, do you know what? That piques my interest and that was the first thing I went to within the book. Yeah. And I, what caught my eye immediately was the transcript of the air traffic control conversation Yeah, yeah. with his flight. Do you want to talk a little bit about that case in particular? Yeah, definitely. Um, And this case is one of my favourites because it, it... you know how we were saying that it's not about bright lights in the sky or green men. This is about a serious phenomenon. And this is exactly why, you know, you have a gentleman here, a 20 year old um, who passed away because uh, w- when he was chasing a UFO. Um, but to start from the beginning, the the encounter happened um, on the 21st of October in 1978 in Australia. And Valentik um, he he was very young. He was just twenty years old, and he was still training to become a pilot. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that he was inexperienced. You know, um, mm-hmm. he was he was still training, and he had around a hundred fifty hours of flying experience. And on the day of the of the incident, he he took off. He departed from uh, Murabin um, in Australia, and he was planning to land in King Island. Um, and as he was, you know, prior to his departure, he confirmed that everything was was in order. Um, given that he was just training and he had a class four instrument, he could only fly when the conditions were optimal. So he couldn't fly under uh, when when there were uh, when it was cloudy or when there wasn't a lot of visibility. So the conditions yeah. were perfect essentially. Um, so he took off, and you know he reached 4,000 feet, everything was fine. He climbed to 4,500 feet, everything was perfect. Um, uh, something I forgot to mention is that he was flying a Cessna, um, uh, a Cessna 182. And he was flying, um, and around 30 minutes into the encounter, um, he started seeing another aircraft in the sky. Um, he didn't see it on radar first, but he started seeing this aircraft in the sky. And given that he has a class four rating, it means that there, there shouldn't be close aircrafts in the vicinity. So he started um, looking on his radar to see if there was, um, I don't know, an aircraft perhaps, but nothing showed up. He contacted the Melbourne Air Traffic Control operators for clarification, um, but they too cannot uh, track any object. It's, it's completely an unregistered target. And as he started describing the UFO, um, because it's unidentified, of course, it was just 1,000 feet above his aircraft. It was, you know, the typical UFO shape. It was disc-shaped. But something he mentioned is that it was very bright. It Mm -hmm. was, he compared it to a landing strip. It was significantly larger. Um, uh, And, you know, he communicates with the the air traffic controller, uh, with the air traffic control operator, he says that the large aircraft was above him and then it goes beneath him. And it continued maneuvering in this way. At, at one point, it's beneath him. At another point, it hovers above him. And it was completely noiseless. Um, he keeps telling them it's, it's just four bright lights. Um, uh, and then as they were talking, he tells them that um, his engine is, is idling. It's rough idling. Um, and he, one thing that struck me is that he tells them that it's playing some sort of game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it decreased its speed, then it increased its speed, 
it traveled at different altitudes. And as as the time went by in a few minutes, um, he tried talking, um, the air traffic control operators, um, they tried to keep contact with him, but he just, he just doesn't reply. The last thing he tells them is that it's hovering on top of him again, and it's not an aircraft. And then there's just um, radio silence. Then no one heard of him, and no one even, um, uh, he obviously didn't land in King Island, but they, he didn't communicate with the air traffic controllers again. Um, uh, and what is also interesting is the extent of the search and rescue operation which happened. Um, naturally, one would assume that if he disappeared, he, he must have crashed the Cessna. But in my research, um, something I did in my research is that I, I researched the, um, the sea, the body of sea he, would, he, would ha- he was traveling over, and it was Bass Strait. It, it's, and I found out that it's a relatively very shallow sea. Um, it's it has a depth of fifty to seventy meters, and you know, given the materials of the Cessna, if if the Cessna had, did indeed crash, then the search and rescue team would have easily located the wreckage, not only the wreckage but either an oil slick um, or the body, of course. But but they didn't find anything. It was he literally just disappeared off the face of the earth, um, naturally never to be seen again. Um, and what makes this case interesting is that there are other corroborating sightings. There, there was a family, um, they were uh, traveling by car, who noticed a bright light in the sky, which suddenly disappeared. Um, now, naturally, I'm, I'm not saying that it, it was the same UFO, but it's interesting that at the same time that Valentik was talking to the air traffic controllers, there was this corroborating sighting as well. The the transcript's quite harrowing as well, and just when you you get into reading it, you can kind of imagine this the scenario in your head. And yeah. like you say, it's a young pilot, but not necessarily a very inexperienced one. They had a good classification and qualification to be flying, and clearly quite a scary time as well. And you can just imagine it the way it's written out. And there's that seventeen seconds of silence, like you say, and then metallic noise, and that's yeah. it. He's never heard from again. Yeah. Why do you think some cases are? well known and blow up within ufology yet other cases like this one yeah, go largely unnoticed do you see anything within your research that would indicate why this isn't a very well known case um prime i was at first i was going to say it's, it's because it happened in australia not the united states but that's not necessarily true because there are other individuals who lost their lives such as thomas mentel and lieutenants monkland and watson they both lost their lives as they were chasing ufos and it's a shame, really, that this case is not one of the most um, known ones, because uh, it's genuinely, it's terrifying, of course. Um, I believe, in my opinion, the reason why such cases are not as known is because of the response which uh, the Air Force has. In, in this case, there wasn't much of a response. In the sense, naturally, there wasn't a full-blown investigation, or at least um, it wasn't be classified if there was one but it's unfortunate that not many people talk about it because i am sure that if we talk about these cases more then may, people would would consider the the topic much more serious if we compare this to the roswell crash i know that this is much more important um and of course um it, it's more detrimental as well yeah, and there's lots more um, less unknown cases like that and amongst all those very well-known uh, and well-researched cases as well. And I won't go into too, uh, any more myself because that just starts spoiling the book for people. People <laughs> should pick it up. Do you have any particular case or part of the book that you really enjoyed writing and researching? Yes, definitely. Um, so, of course, um, uh, the Tic Tac and Gimbal, of course, they are very well-known cases, but one of my favourite cases um and 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 i guess we'll stay on the topic of people <laughs> disappearing and dying which is quite morbid but uh, one of my favorite cases was the death of thomas mentel um basically there was a case in 1948 um and thomas mentel he was very experienced um he was a military guy um and he was patrolling the sky um he well, the air force base in godman they received a call saying that they had seen a ufo in the sky 
um, and they confirmed that it was not military in any way. Um, so the Godman Air Force Base, they they uh, they they asked they asked Mantel to to scramble in a jet and pursue the object. And what is interesting is that he was talking to the air traffic controllers as well. And at one point, he tells them that it's above him. Um, he's going to 20,000 feet. And as he does say that, he disappears completely. Um, he disappears. But naturally, with this case, Thomas Mantel's aircraft actually crashed, um, uh, which is different than Valentik, of course. So here, people saw Mantel chasing a bright light, um, followed by his aircraft crashing to the ground. Um, so this is one of my my this is perhaps my one of my favorite topics. Uh, one sorry, my one of my favorite cases, um, because you have a credible source, you have a credible military man, um, and there are many witnesses who saw the UFO and the mental aircraft, and they of course witnessed uh, the fatal crash. It's interesting that you've picked a case where someone, of course, passes away or dies as a result of the 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 yeah. encounter yeah i also picked one of those yet they're lesser known cases most if not all exclusively of the big well-known cases in ufology don't result in a death of exactly. you know, a human being yeah. and i wonder if that's part of the reason do you think that people tend to go towards them because it's a more peaceful yeah. encounter in that sense yeah yeah i definitely get what you mean um like I said, it's quite morbid when someone loses their lives. But if we look at Roswell, it's entertaining. You know, it's something that's it's 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 something somewhat trivial in the sense that did a flying saucer crash or was it a weather balloon? Even the the response of the military, it's ludicrous, and that in itself makes it something people want to talk about. But if we look at Mantel's death and Valentik's disappearance, it's serious. There wasn't um, a ridiculous response by the military and perhaps that's why people uh, perhaps shy away from them because i mean it's quite morbid and it's if you read about it too much it, it brings you down in, in a sense when compared to roswell or the battle of la where it, those cases are just fascinating you know you're seeing a ufo um the military is shooting at it but it's not coming down that is just fascinating but these cases tend to be more unfortunate now the the book's been out. I think was it April this year it was released. Yeah, yeah, in April. Yeah, uh, so it's been out now. We're, we're talking four months. Is there anything you're looking back and w you would change about the book, or was there anything that you wanted to include but for some reason you couldn't quite make it into the final copy? Um, I definitely wanted to include pictures. Um, I think that's the one thing that's missing from the book. Um, but it was uh, it. I could we couldn't do it. From the for the time frame we had, and also to get there are so many cases that to get uh, rights for each case it would have been close to impossible. Um, uh, and now that now uh, after the book has been published and I've had multiple conversations, uh, people told me that there were um, they sometimes I have a conversation and they tell me did you hear about this case or that case, um, and of course I'm like yeah maybe that should have made the cut. Um, but in a, I, I'm very happy with the way it turned out because, in a sense, it also encourages the reader to do their own research. Um, in fact, there are citations everywhere, so someone can easily look up the source I used. Um, so I'm happy that it's written in a way that it will encourage someone who wants to learn more to uh, do further readings as well. Yeah, and I can I can assure any readers in what I've read of the book and the parts I've jumped in and out of, it's written in such a way that I don't think you need the pictures. And that's something I tend to do with UFO books is you pick them up and flick through for the pictures, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> it's written in a way, you, you'll see it in your head. And like I say, that Frederick Valentich uh, encounter, I can see it as I'm reading it in my head, what it would look like to me. And yeah. you know what? Sometimes that's better than looking at a picture from, you know, the 70s or 60s or, yeah. or 80s yeah. where it's grainy, fuzzy, and it's just, it's just an you know unknown light on yeah. the page anyway so I, I think that leaves a little bit more to the imagination which can be really lacking sometimes in, yeah. in these books and it's it's very well written in that sense Warren as well that means so much thank you 
No, no, it's and it's true. I wouldn't just say that otherwise, so I would make up something else. Um, I, I don't want to spoil any more of the content in the book. People should give that a read. Um, it gives a lot of really good coverage to existing cases, and also, like I've said, those those lesser known cases as well are really fascinating. The the timing of the book, though, was there anything to do with the release date that it came out at a time of year when there were a lot of eyes on the subject people were getting into the subject because we'd had the task force report being announced yeah and it was due to come out in the june uh was there anything to that or was that just a happy coincidence um the thing is i i had written the book but i held on to it for a very long time um uh, and then as i was real um the for for example I by into in 2017 I had written the majority of the book, um, but then as the Tic Tac UFO um, report came out, the the video, I realized that many more reports are gonna come out, and that's when we we saw Gimbal and Go Fast, and that's when we heard about ATIP as well. Um, so so the more time passed, the more information came out, and as well when I was writing, I was realizing that the more time I have, the more information I'm getting. And there's always something that I that potentially I missed, and I'm sure that if I go back, I can find even more information. Um, so I held on to the book for a very long time because things were progressing in a way that something was happening. You know, the conversation was actually starting. But then in 2020, I sent it in uh, to the publishers, um, and um, the timing was perfect because the videos were creating a conversation. Um, the task force, uh, the report were create a conversation. And then there is, um, I, I threw in my book, which also created the conversation. I had people reading reading my book first. Um, and then I tell them, listen, people are actually talking about it right now. There is a document about to come out. And I would, uh, you know, encourage them to look at the videos, look at the report. So um, it was a bit of a coincidence, a lucky coincidence. But also, uh, I'm happy that it happened in such a way. Uh, at later on, I'm going to get your thoughts on the task force report as well. But I just want to mention before we get to listener questions, Warren, um, you are uh, your second book you mentioned that you're already writing. Um, how has that come about so quickly? And you mentioned it's going to be on the abduction phenomenon. Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, interestingly, many of the information I have right now is that I was. I was planning to include it in, in the first book. The first I was planning on the first book being divided into uh, UFO sightings and abductions, but there were so many sightings that it would have been such a long book, and I myself would not have picked it up. It would have been discouraging to pick it up. To pick up, and I also don't want to do a disservice to the cases or the abductions. You know, they deserve um all the all the detail that they have so so that's why the first book i i wanted to focus just on sightings and now the second book on abductions so that i make sure that i include every single detail possible um so so that's how um so a lot of the information i had already researched but now i'm going over it again uh, firstly to make sure that it's correct and now i'm also adding a lot of information as well what what sort of time scale are you looking at for for getting that book written and out to the public? I'm hoping to publish it definitely in the, in the in this year or the following one. Um, I I don't like rushing my well. I do rush myself a lot, um, and when there's that sort of pressure, um, it it tends to be proactive, or uh, it it can either be proactive or it keeps you back from writing the best uh, that you can write. But right now I'm taking it easy in the sense that I'm making sure that each chapter that I write, it's it's perfect and I'm happy with it. And that's when I move on to the next chapter. So I'm taking it slowly to make sure that everything I write is accurate and it's well written and it doesn't do a disservice to the people who actually um, had the encounter themselves. Well, that certainly comes out in the finished product of the first book. So I, I would look forward to that within the second, Warren. Warren, uh, listener questions. Let's get to some of those for you. Um, Dave asked, now, the third section in your book covers military responses to UFO sightings. Mm -hmm. Do you think the military have modified their pursuit or tracking strategy over the years? Um, they definitely... Uh, 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 okay. is, is the question asking how has it uh, changed over time? 
Yeah, well, he was asking, do you think they've modified their pursuit or tracking well, strategy over over time? If you're looking at yes, cases from okay. the 50s, 60s, 70s onwards, do you think it's changed or have yeah. they not been able to? I think most definitely. For example, if we look at um, the 40s or, or the 50s, even later on the years, uh, a lot of jets were scrambled to to chase down these UFOs. And I think over time, we're hearing less about that because of the technology which we have. Um, for example, I, if I, when I was doing my research for the Tic Tac UFO, I was reading about the technology which they have um, on the USS Nimitz and all these sensors they have. It's genuinely just mind-blowing. Um, so I don't think that, that, that they do need to scramble a UFO jet when they can do everything on the screen, um, on deck. They don't need to scramble any fighter jets, in my opinion. Um, but it also shows in the cases. For example, uh, the tech stack, the gimbal, um, a lot of the information we have, it's from the radar. Naturally, mm. our radar is so advanced nowadays that um, I think the focus is more on that now, as opposed to chasing down UFOs, trying to pursue um, pursue them, essentially. I think as well, a lot of the recent, especially when it comes to the Tic Tac, some of the conversation around the behavior of these objects, um, and I likened it to a little bit like if you are, if you have a fly or, you know, a bee or a wasp that's annoying you and yeah. you try to swat it with your hand, yeah. you never seem to be able to hit it, even if it's sitting exactly. still. Yeah. Or, and that's the way these objects, they almost seem indifferent to any form of engagement. Exactly. until the point where they have to move yeah. and that makes me wonder is it some sort of control or you know defense mechanism that there's something in the proximity triggers an alert and it moves yeah or yeah. is there some intelligent control behind those particularly have you got any thoughts on that uh, that's such a perfect way to put it um in my opinion if these aircrafts are not piloted um, remotely uh, are not remotely controlled, then the anatomy of these beings must be completely different. Um, we're looking at objects who exceed the speed of sound. I mean, by tens, by ten times, and there's, there's the, no human being and no anatomy can even withstand that. So I think that they could be remotely controlled in that way. If they're not remotely controlled, then the anatomy of these beings is so different than ours. Um, and I think, um, as a, right now I'm thinking, uh, why aren't we sort of chasing them down? And I think it's because we're observing more nowadays. I think we learned that these objects, we cannot pursue them because we cannot, ev we can never catch them. So it makes sense to just observe them from afar and see how they behave, see their maneuvers, see how, see their propulsion system. Um, I think observation makes, uh, it is a better tool. It's, it's a better learning tool than actually chasing them down absolutely um dave also asks warren in your book you are keen to only look at well evidenced sightings yes has this become harder to determine since the advent of digital photography from the 90s onwards yes that uh, that's a big yes definitely um that's a good question for example the macmillanville photographs the reason um they're old you know they couldn't have replicated them but nowadays yep. Even if you go on, on social media, you see so many pictures of UFOs. Um, most of them are badly edited and you know that they're photoshopped, but others are very convincing. Um, so that's why I go to documented cases, cases which there was a formal investigation. Um, I'm not saying that if you see a UFO and you take a picture of it, it means that it's not extraterrestrial or anything. But I wanted to focus on facts um, and documented facts for the simple reason that that's one way of convincing people. Um, telling someone that you saw a UFO and you captured it on your iPhone is one thing, but then showing that same person uh, an Air Force document showing the full-scale response, that's more convincing and that's something else. Yeah, and, and that's a really good question from Dave and something we've discussed on the podcast, Warren, that if you look online, like you said, there are so many clear pictures. Everyone wants a 4K or an 8K yeah, yeah. resolution image. If we did see one, or there was one out there already, mm -hmm. we would probably dismiss it as being exactly. fake because one... it would look too good. And also, yeah. what, what does a genuine UFO or UAP look like? 1,000%. 100%. Um, I think um, 
the, the way that these aircrafts operate, it's with an anti-gravity propulsion system. And these gravitational waves, they create a distortion, which um, uh, when you take a picture of it, is just um, a ball of light. So it's sort of impossible to take a clear picture of them. But like you said, if we do take a 4K picture of it and we see these details, it's something out of a sci-fi movie. And I myself, if I saw a picture and it was so detailed, I would immediately dismiss it. Um, so that's a good point. Absolutely. And you know what? There's there's probably a good chance, Warren, that there's an image out there online that everyone dismisses as being fake, yeah. that is 100% genuine. And exactly. we just go, nope, definitely not. And I'm probably guilty of that as well. But that's yeah. just the subject that, that, that we're in. Um, Nathan has a question, and I've got to give Nathan a shout out as he is a, a, a regular contributor and longtime listener to the podcast. But he is now also a co-host of Calling All Beings, a, a new podcast from himself and DJ San Marco. Uh, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, Nathan's a really good guy to talk to as well, and he had some really good questions for you. Um, he wants to know why you think hard evidence is so difficult to come by. Um, because it's so impossible to access. Um, impossible in the sense that um, it's so difficult to access this information that you just give up and you just don't see the point in it. For example, when I used to research UFOs, prior to writing a book and before I wanted to write a book, I used to find it so difficult to actually find something that's so that's credible um, that it made it impossible to even find an Air Force document. It took pages and pages down the Google search um, search bar to actually find the report. Um, so the fact that it's so inaccessible and it's so difficult to to get your hands on, it just, that's why I guess, um, that's why it's so difficult and many people just couldn't be bothered doing it as well. An interesting follow-up to that from Nathan is, in your opinion, what would a scientific study of extraterrestrials look like if they themselves don't want to be studied? Uh, and he mentions he's further interested in this because if ET are substantially more advanced than we are, how would we even have a framework by which to understand them and their technology? That's uh, that's a perfect question. Um, I think a scientific study into into it is would be how the aircrafts or operate um for instance bob lazar um just uh, i'm sure that nathan has heard of him um but we yeah. look, at, look at how the aircraft operates um, we will look at the propulsion system um but apart from that um with the scientific method you need factual evidence and um and if you follow the laws of physics it becomes impossible to even investigate it um, like Nathan said, the, the technology is so advanced that we cannot comprehend how these aircrafts operate or how these, uh, how their their body, their anatomy, we just cannot understand it. So I think there's a discrepancy and also um, it's like paradoxical. It's like you want to do a scientific investigation, but if we're going to use the laws of physics, um, it's it's going to become impossible to actually investigate it. Um and then moving on to it is our, uh, do they want to be known? Do they want to be seen? I see it as though they are here for their own reasons and not ours, in the sense that when you drive down and you see uh, a cow on the side of the city, you don't stop to have a conversation with it. Um, you just continue on your way. And I think it is are in the same way. They're just not bothered. Or they don't care about our intentions. They don't care about whether we want to investigate them or not. Um, and I think that's why it's also so difficult to investigate it as well, if that makes sense. Yeah. Do you do you think that we have the understanding or technology at the moment to study these objects substantially, or do you think we're still a ways off? I, uh, I think we are getting there. I think that the fact that we are considering the idea of the existence of an anti-gravity propulsion system, that's already a step forward. I mean, a few years ago, you wouldn't even consider such a thing. But I think nowadays that we're throwing these ideas that you would see in a sci-fi movie and we're actually considering them, it makes it more, um, it makes it a little bit easier, I guess, to understand how these aircraft may operate. Um, and by no means am I saying that it is easy to investigate them because I think it's impossible 
to even understand how they fully work. But I think that nowadays there are some some theories which sort of make sense, but are also limited in their own way as well. I want to ask just very quickly before we go into the next listener question, the, mm-hmm. the, the title of the book again, Evidence of Extraterrestrials. Are you think are you going along the lines that this is all extraterrestrial or would you subscribe to the idea that potentially some of these objects may be from this planet already and i by that i still don't mean human yeah um uh, by uh, well uh, going uh, by extraterrestrial i i refer to otherworldly so originates from outside earth um but the premise of of the investigation of the book is that is that the way the aircraft operates, could it be man-made? If the answer is no, then I would, I, I rather, I put it in the category of extraterrestrial. Um, but I make that distinction very clearly in the sense that I, I do consider the fact that this could be, you know, advanced technology by China or, or Russia. But if something genuinely um, defies the law of gravity, defies the law of, of physics or, or the natural laws, then it's impossible for it to be extraterrestrial. It's impossible for it to be terrestrial. It's impossible to for it to have been made on Earth, and that's when it, it goes into the extraterrestrial category. Uh, that's how I sort of worked it out in my head. Do Do you think there's any possibility, though, Warren, that we have another species sharing this same planet, um, potentially? not in the same dimension, but maybe they are, that we just don't know are already here with us. And yeah. that's where some of these come from. Yeah. Um, the, th- I, the thing is that there are so many things that we don't know, even if we look at dimension, uh, dimensions and the idea of interdimensions um, and even spirituality in the sense that we don't, we have very limited information about it. So if if I were to say no, it's impossible, that's just... Um, that's just completely inaccurate because I am full aware that the possibility is there. Um, and that's an interesting question. Could it be an interdimensional being still um, here on Earth? And yes, um, that's so interesting because I never considered that as a possibility for these beings to have constructed such an aircraft. But it's completely possible, of course. It definitely is. Yeah, especially from the, the Tic Tac point of view, there's there's a lot of people um, thinking that given these objects seem to be around the Catalina Islands off the coast yeah. of San Diego, yeah. that they they potentially, they're, they've been seen coming in from orbit, and that's yeah. not necessarily deep space, we, we don't know that yet, but they exactly. then drop down and then they go back under the water, yeah. that yeah. it could be they're, they're already from here, but that's just, who knows, it's it, it's it's crazy, because when you first get into this subject, everyone's the same, where you wonder, are there aliens coming and flying saucers from other planets, yeah. but very quickly there's so much more opens up in the conversation, and it's just, uh, I think so much is on the table right now. Exactly, um, and, and that island is definitely a hotspot, and sometimes we have to look um beneath us as opposed to what's above us maybe you know un- unidentified submerged objects are a thing it's not always um from outside space but the ocean is even more um uh, complex and we don't we know less about the ocean than we do about space so we have to keep that in mind as well absolutely um, less about me let's go on with some more listener questions <laughs> um, we had genosis asks are there any cases you feel show significant behavior by the phenomenon yet they remain relatively unspoken about in mainstream ufology yes um the malicious well it's a harsh word to say but the malicious intentions that these beings may have in the sense that uh, we talked about valentic and mantel but there are other instances in which human beings were harmed or were threatened um, an example of these UFOs threatening um, military aircrafts is the Brazilian uh, UFO encounter or the Tehran incident. These are all instances in which the UFOs either posed harm or threatened to pose harm. Um, and like I said, it's not always just seeing a bright light in the sky. Sometimes there's actual uh, a threat to security where there's all there's always a threat to security but in these instances um the ufos are posing direct threat to um to the pilots 
Absolutely, especially in some of those cases we, we talked about earlier. It's something that many aren't necessarily comfortable talking about in the community because it shows, it could be accidental, but there is potentially an element of, of danger involved in these encounters, whether that's a physical you know interaction or even just radiation left over and exactly. you hear about people getting sick sometime later. That, a, exactly. that could be something though that some of these beings don't even realize happens or it might be something that they're just not they don't care about in the sense that we don't necessarily care about stepping on an ant exactly. or you know exactly. harming a smaller animal or a fish because it's, it's beneath us and lower but that's just an idea yeah um, last last listener question warren from mike he says with the risk that something is a hoax or people misremember facts how difficult is it to take a step back and try and remain unbiased on the stories that you're writing about um that's a, a good question and my approach was that can i can i try and disprove this case if it was very easy to disprove a case i would just not include it in the book um and, and and that's why in the book I just present cases which are very, very difficult to disprove because there were many cases in which the account was very convincing. But then as you take a, a, a deeper look at it, you start noticing certain plot holes and then you start noticing certain um, uh, inaccuracies. Um, so it's very important to take a step back and you go into the case with without um, uh, the intention of proving that it's extraterrestrial. So when I was researching the case, I didn't go with the idea of proving that this is ET. It's more um, investigating the, the case and then what do the results say? So it's important not to go into cases with already a preconceived notion that it's going to be an extraterrestrial encounter. Of course. Th thank you to the listeners for sending in those questions. Uh, thanks to everyone who got in touch. We're going to finish off, Warren, with the quick fire round. I'm going to mention some names, some places, and you can give me as short an answer as you want, or you can discuss it in a bit more detail. It's completely up to yourself. Cool. So the first one is someone you mentioned earlier, but what are your thoughts on Bob Lazar? Bob is very credible, um, and there's, n there's no reason why to think that it's a hoax. I mean, the guy... Um, essentially, his life was threatened numerous occasions, and if you look at all of his all of his accounts, all of his details, I think he's one hundred percent legit. I mean, the guy talked about element one fifteen before we even knew it existed, and there's you can't have more proof than that. I am um, just a side note. I actually bought my uh, Bob Lazar sketch that they, he's advertising on his website, and it arrived today, That's all the way amazing. from the United States. That's um, amazing. I was I was also hit with a twenty one pounds custom charge. So <laughs> there's just there's just another way the government's getting at Bob Lazar <laughs> and you know knocking him. So yeah, that was that was nice to pay this morning. So thanks for that, the UK Postal Service and Customs. Um, next up, Warren Skinwalker Ranch. What are your thoughts? Ah. Uh. I think it's part fiction, part facts. Um, I think it's a bunch of facts, but also we, as humans, we throw in a little bit of our imagination to make it more interesting. That's my opinion on it. What do you think then? I'll, I'll just push you a little bit on that. Uh, what do you think may realistically be going on there? I, I think it, it, it is definitely a hotspot, you know, like, like where the Tic Tac encounter happened. But I think that it's a lot of things which we do not know. So when someone says that, um, you know, there's UFOs, there's um, a bunch of supernatural things happening, potentially, but you cannot come to conclusions just because um, uh, mysterious activities are happening. So I think it's a lot of unanswered questions and little details which can allow us to come to any conclusions. Sure. Next up, your thoughts on Louise Elizondo. I think once again, he's genuine. Um, I, if we look at Bob Lazar, the government did everything to try and discredit him. And that's what happened. That's what's happening with Elizondo as well. Mm, um, yep. uh, I mean, the, his, if we look at the, the claims he has made, I think he backed it up with evidence. You know, he backed up with evidence. And of course, the Pentagon is going to say the guy never worked here. Of course, they're going to say he was never the director of ATIP. Because if they did actually acknowledge his um, his his presence in, 
in the in A tip, they would essentially be saying that everything he's saying is true. So the easy way, the easiest way to deal with it is to essentially just try and discredit him. No, I I agree, and it's a very similar pattern as to what happened then, as to to what's happening now. I just think with Luis Elizondo, it's happening more in the public sphere, as we're yeah. seeing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, something that we've we've not really touched on yet, um, but might be the answer may be within the title of your book. But I want to know, Warren, what in your opinion is behind this phenomenon? What is going on? Um, I think what's going on is that there is there are other beings from other planets, other you know, um, other galaxies, um, extraterrestrial beings, and they're using us. Uh, they're using the planet for their own for their own reasons, for their own sources, um, as well as the beings. Um, they're using us sort of as laboratory rats in the sense that they're they're observing us. Uh, if you look at ob- abductions. Um, it's a lot of um, experiments, um, but it's also got to do with the psyche as well. I think it's got more to do with our, with the psyche rather than the physical body. So I think if we had to look at the phenomenon as a whole, as a holistic way, it would be extraterrestrial beings using um, our planet for its resources, for for their own research, and then using humans for their own research, for their own research, for their own intentions as well. Excellent. And finally, uh, Warren, what does disclosure mean to you? Um, disclosure means having a conversation about the phenomenon. Um, and disclosure is happening right now. I mean, there will never be a day where where uh, there will be a CNN headline saying the government admits aliens are real. That will never happen. And it doesn't need to happen because um, with the information and the evidence we have right now, we can come to a conclusion ourselves. So I would say that disclosure is a conversation which we have um, where we present the facts and we separate fact from fiction. Awesome. Really good answer. Warren, it's been amazing talking to you. Just before you hit, uh, leave us today, how can people follow you and also how can they get a hold of your work? Um, so my book is available on Amazon, uh, Book Depository or anywhere else where you get to, uh, where you get books. And you can follow me on Facebook. Um, I post there um, about UFO, uh, well about UFO news, uh, uh, things about my book, um, and anything UFO related. Excellent, that's great, Warren. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back on the podcast in the future, especially when that second book comes out. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure, um, and thank you for the listeners as well. Very interesting questions. That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a Tic Tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer. A little Baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Folk. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shoved out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of fateful on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. I'm like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. I jumped back and nearly kissed myself. Then I climbed out the window after the elf. And I woke up in my bed and there was something on my head. And everything was weird and everything was red. I called up my boys. They thought this was noise. They thought it was a dream. They thought it was my toys. They thought it was my problems. And they think I should see therapy. And I don't know what it is because it doesn't really scare me.
Consider your heart, consider time, consider your space, consider your lies, consider your life, consider your eyes. Tic-tac and not quite a saucer.